So we did we did paper three with the discount rate. So you have that down. So now for paper four, again, what do you need? We talked about it earlier, but so you need a dividend zero R free cash flow per share zero. You need your earnings per share zero. Another term for zero is trailing 12 months. The dividend, you can't quite get that from Yahoo Finance. You have to do a little extra work to do that, but you can definitely get uh, earnings per share. We need an inflation rate. We need a long-term growth rate, a short-term growth rate, and an H. So once you have all those, you got all the numbers you need, the dividend zero free cash flow per share, we can get this from Yahoo Finance on the dividend side. So if you look at Yahoo Finance, so we're doing Walmart. So it shows you a dividend right here, but they call it the forward dividend. So that's not the dividend. I don't know why they changed this. It's kind of irritating, but we have to go to historical data. And instead of historical pet prices, you want dividends only. And you apply and you just, it's the trailing 12 months. So you, I mean, be careful. You can't always assume it's the last four if they don't pay quarterly, but they pay quarterly, it's just the last four. So 56 times three plus 57. So you get 225. All of that four dividends, I think I've told you all this before, all they're doing is taking the last dividend times four, but that's completely bogus number. So not a valuable number. How do you get free cash flow per share? Well, there you can get it from Bloomberg. Bloomberg has that. You can actually bring it in. Or the way I, I really correct me, you do you cash from operations minus cap X divided by shares outstanding, which is essentially what I think that's exactly what Bloomberg is doing. So what are they saying? Cash from operations. Well, cash from operations, that's net of interest expense. So this is belongs to stockholders. Minus cap X, or essentially what they're saying is, well, management has all this cash flow, but they have to reinvest a bunch of it in the company. So we're not going to count that as a free cash flow. Now that's where the biggest error here is because some of that CapEx is not reinvested to keep the company where it is. Some of it's expansion expansionary. But if you just need a quick number, that works. And in Sarah's outstanding, you can get that from Yahoo Finance. So those are your choices. Now today, Hieronimo and Larissa had their investment society sector team and Larissa, I don't know if you've seen, if you have her file, but um, she had it set up really well. So she just pulled all these numbers in from Bloomberg and Capital IQ. Um, so she was able to bring in, there's a there's an account in, in Bloomberg that does the free cash flow per share. She just pulled that right in the Bloomberg, you know, it's all set up and ready to go. Now, are, are these going to be the same numbers? So Hieronimo, they were doing Adobe. Well, Adobe doesn't pay dividends, so that's going to be zero. But their free cash flow per share was like $15. So Larissa used that to value Adobe. She got a value, pretty reasonable looking value for the stock. The stock's trading for $375. She got a value of like $420 or something. So it was, it was a reasonable number. And then she did HX, I guess was the next one. And there, the stock was trading for 108. She got 103, but she didn't change her beta. She's got to look at her beta. But she did her beta. She did everything just like you're doing here. She did the whole process. And she got, even with Adobe, she got a good value, even though the dividends is zero. So you can do companies that don't have dividends. I wanted one company I was telling y'all back that I really, really liked was that Floor Decor. Unfortunately, their recent free cash flow is negative. 
Does that mean you can't do them? Well, you can do a normalized free cash flow, which means, yeah, the recent year is negative, but if you look over the last four or five years, you try to get what is a normal free cash flow. So something unusual happened last year, ignore that. Looks like the previous two years or something. <clears throat> so most firms can be valued. There are firms that have no, Z, no dividends and their free cash flow is still negative. Those are firms that we can value, but we can't value at these models. We have to do something else. So what we have here just doesn't work for those firms. Earnings per share is zero. That's very simple. That we just get straight from Yahoo Finance. That's an easy one. Right on the summary page. You can even tell because it says TTM. So 428. Now, there are firms out there, let's see if this is true. I'm not sure this is true right now, but it might be. Not yet, but <clears throat> there are firms sometimes that their earnings per share is actually lower than their dividend. You know something strange is going on if that's the case. I would probably avoid a company like that because they're they're doing something that's that's unusual. So just be careful on that. So you, you would expect earnings per share to be higher the dividends. Real important, and I would certainly bring this up in an interview, dividend discount models are assuming that this 225 is their free cash flow per share. That's the simplification of dividend discount model. They're assuming they're one and the same. For Walmart, that might be the case. Who knows? We could calculate it. Let's, let's try it real quickly because it's really easy to calculate. You just go to their financials. Oops, it's got to be Walmart. And they can be radically different. You go to financials, you go to cash flow statement. And I would go, I wouldn't do the trailing 12 months. I would do the last year. So their cash from operation is 29,101. I might have done this earlier in class, but we'll do it again. 29,101. FX. You get that under investing cash flows. If you're looking for that property, plant, and equipment, 16,687. Free cash flow. Shares out. So I get this on the cash flow statement. This you get on the income statement. Shares outstanding. Basic shares, two, seven, two, four. And so, I'm sorry, this is free cash flow. I did it backwards. Free cash flow per share. You can see we get a much, much larger number, 456 versus 225. If I were doing Walmart, I'd use the dividend per share. But if you have a firm that you want to try them both and just see if they're radically different, you can certainly do that. For Walmart, it is radically different, but I think I get way too high of a valuation. I really I think actually right now that their numbers are somewhat exaggerated because they're still benefiting from the COVID lockdowns. And so I don't believe that 456. That's the other thing you can look at is normalize it. So you can certainly look at their cash from operations over time. There you see the COVID real huge impact, but over time, if you wanna do kind of a normalized number over time, you can, you can do that as well. Um, so I have students to say, what exactly do I do? And the answer is, I don't know, because every company is different. There is, I mean, you should be happy that you don't just pull obvious numbers and stick them into the model, right? Because how much would they pay you to do that? If you just looked at the numbers, stuck it in the model, you get a price. Are they going to pay you 700000 a year to do that? Something you could have done in third grade. Because it's, it's got to be complicated. That's why they pay you so much. So we're, we're somewhat simplifying it here. But in reality, every one of these assumptions, you're going to scrutinize very, very carefully. Our inflation rate, I don't know what you use there, but we had an inflation rate up here, didn't we? 
We use two and a half percent. So I'm probably going to keep consistent with that and just go back to that number. Remember when we we're trying to get earnings growth, we had an inflation number there. Y'all remember that? So use two and a half percent. And then long term growth. My economic growth assumption was five and a half percent. So is Walmart going to grow in line with the economy, slower than the economy, faster than the economy? So my idea on Walmart, I've mentioned this before, basically they have so many stores, they just really can't build them. And at that point, what do they grow by? They grow by population growth plus inflation. That's about all they have. Once they can't add any more stores. So uh, our 230 Investment Society team, they're doing consumer staples. We're looking at a firm like Sprouts versus a firm like uh, Flower. Well, Sprouts can add a lot more stores and that can give them some pretty hefty growth, but ultimately they add all the stores they can. Ultimately, what can they do is population growth and uh, inflation. Then you got a firm like Flower, they make bread. They probably benefited from COVID, although their earnings growth wasn't as great. But why would suddenly people start buying bread? And we're doing Colgate. Why would you suddenly start buying a bunch of toothpaste? Any of you are like, man, I need to start buying more toothpaste. Hopefully you're not saying that. Do you really need more toothpaste this year than you did last year? You know, so it's there's not much you can do. So why does the population growth? You know, we said labor growth was 1%. Inflation two and a half. So, you know, I might say four, four percent or something, but there is no answer. I can't give you on the long-term growth. All I can say is you somewhat tie it to the economic growth. It's going to be in the ballpark. Usually large sector, you know, well-established firms are not going to grow as fast as the economy because remember, a lot of economic growth is going to come from those new companies that don't exist yet. They're going to be growing at eight, nine, ten percent, and so well-established firms are going to grow more slowly. So you're probably going to be in the four to six percent range again here, but probably for most of you firms, it would be a little more. And I even say that for Google and Alphabet. Ultimately, these big firms, once they're trillion-dollar firms, they it's they can't grow much faster. I mean, if you think about it, population plus inflation, maybe four and a half, I don't know, 2% population, two and a half percent inflation. Why would population grow faster? Well, in the US, we have good immigration. So while the birth rate may only add 1%, you may get one, one and a half percent from immigration, you know, so that's all the kind of stuff you're going to discuss. And I can't tell you what that is. This is why you took economics. That's why you, you, know, you got to think on your own. I will tell you, not to scare you, but to, but in order to scare you, I'm giving you a million times more than your boss will give you. <laughs> All right? What does your boss give you? She's going to give you a chair and a desk. What is she going to give you other than that? Nothing. My first finance job is like, what do I do? Fortunately, Lisa was there, so she... Kind of showed me, oh, here's what you're supposed to do. My, my boss was like, no, just do your job, whatever your job description was. And my job description was make USA better. So it's okay, well, I'll do that then. And it's finance. Accounting was wonderful. I started in accounting. They tell you exactly what to do every second of the day. And you flip over to finance. They just assume you know how to do it. Now, there are training that people do, investment banks. They do have some training. We're probably going to do a pitch book class in the investment society next semester. Where we'll do the basic pitch books that you're taught. So there is some of that, but they're expecting you to know 95% of it. And they'll show you that and they're not teaching you finance, they're teaching you their particular template, how they like to view the world, but they're assuming you already know it. All right. So you can come to me and say, what should I do? And I can give you some ideas, but ultimately you're gonna have to use all the stuff you've learned in your classes to, to put in there. Now on the short-term rate. I gave you uh, Bill Gates. I gave you three 
approach is not to get the short term rate, but to get some ballpark. So you can certainly look at history. You can look at the peg ratio. And you can look at sustainable growth. But ultimately, it's your opinion. What do you think? All right. So for history, I don't know if I can bring up history on Walmart. I wish I could do uh, cap capital IQ, but it's not loaded in this machine. I'll give you the last three years. So their earnings, you're looking at the growth and earnings per share. Their earnings per share has, has actually declined the last three years. So that doesn't help me much because, you know, obviously they had a huge growth in 2020, although that's even the pre, I think, yeah, this is even pre-COVID. So it, I, these numbers don't quite make sense anyway, but so I, I need some history on growth to try to get that. Um, I like to do rolling three, five, and 10 years from capital, cap IQ. Let me see if I can get cap IQ just so you can see how it works. So how do you do cap IQ? Go to UTSA library, do my UTSA and go to the lab, go, go to the library through my UTSA, do databases. Do y'all have cap IQ accounts, all of y'all? Hopefully 100% of you. So go under C, find Capital IQ, and hope you remember your password. You have to use your UTSA EDU account. You have to, you, if you don't have an account, just set one up. As long as you go through, I have some students try to do it, try to do it through, um, themselves without going through the library and you, you really have to do it through the library. And it looks like there's some system problem. Yeah, that's not working. So let's try this. So it, it does work. Not when you're teaching a class, it doesn't work. But I've asked them to add Cap IQ to this machine, but I, I can't get them to add it for some reason. But Cap IQ is real finicky with the uh, the IT people. All right, so well, hopefully that'll come up and I can show you all here eventually, but I'll come back to it. We'll see. So with Cap IQ, when you go to Cap IQ, you get your account, you type in your company, click on the income statement, do the bar back on the time and just say download all financials and you'll get all the financials and then you can you can do rolling rolling periods pretty easily uh, finally I know if I kept talking it would finally work we'll try one last time if I try a different data source Now you shouldn't do capital IQ not because of this paper. You should do it because you got to get capital IQ on your resume. So if you don't have enough capital IQ on your resume, this is a good way to do it. Just um, I used to not do capital IQ because I never saw it when I was in industry, but now I see it all the time. I'm seeing almost as much as I'm seeing Bloomberg. All right, last last chance. Yay. So see if you try it 50 times, it does work. All right, so I'll do Walmart. And then just click on income statement or whatever. Go back as far as you want to go. I'm just going to download this page just to keep it keep it simple. Now, this is using Cap IQ straight from the site. You can also load it onto your Excel and do it from Excel. And the nice thing about that, some of y'all may, may want to try this. Uh, Hieronimo, you were y'all were doing this. Cap IQ has stock valuation models that you can actually download and use in Excel if you want to use one of their models. So that works as well.
Sorry. Someone somewhere at UTSA said, How, what can we do to make our internet much slower at UTSA that would so benefit our classes? And they they won, they, they did a great job of it. I don't know whose decision that was. Okay, so here we have an income statement. There's, I would use the diluted earnings per share. How far back do you go? Well, probably don't need to go back that far. You might look at revenue as well. That might not be a bad thing to look at. So earnings per share, you can just look at annual numbers. See what those rates are. And see the last few years it's been pretty volatile, right? There you see Amazon coming in. The last few years, they've averaged 8%, but that was 32% up once and then down 9% all over the place. You can certainly look at the three-year, five-year, 10-year. Wait a second. Y'all know how to do CAGRs, right? So here's revenue. You take the ending number divided by the beginning number. You have to go back not three years, but three years go back four because you're doing you need a base year. Raise that to the one divided by three minus one. Do the same thing for earnings per share. So the earnings per share last three years is really, really big growth, 9%. We can do the same thing for um, five years. So how many years do I go back? Five. Someone tell me. Five year bagger, go back six years, right? Is one over five minus one. And then 10 years, see we're probably not gonna get such a great, how many years ago back? Just 11, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11. Not such great growth, is there? Can you do that? Earnings per share, not very good growth. So that's where you see the Amazon effect. Amazon definitely impacting them quite dramatically. Last three years, COVID certainly helped them a lot. I helped the last five years as well, but the last 10, not much growth. So what do you do with that? So I've had students say, which of those numbers do I pick? I mean, you don't pick any of them. They're just, they're just telling you what the growth has been. What's the correlation between historical growth and future growth? It's all over the place, depends on the company. Uh, who knows? I mean, Zoom had some incredible growth two years ago, didn't they? Are they still having that kind of growth today? Probably not. So, um, all right, so you can get that with Capital IQ. So you don't have to use Capital IQ, but I'd encourage you, you can see how fast and how easy you can get, you can get a lot of data. So I like to look at, I like to look at revenue. But the real key is earnings per share. That's what you're really after. You can see their, sort, their recent growth has been really strong, but longer term growth has not been so strong. So just like that, we have some history. Now, what if we ignore all these numbers? Does that mean you don't put it in the paper? But you, you still can put it in the paper. You can say, now I want to get um, an assumption for the short-term growth for Walmart. 
Their growth recently has been really strong because of COVID and lockdowns, a 9% three-year and 7.4% five-year CAGR. Longer term hasn't been so strong because of the competition, intense competition, only 1.5% uh, 10 years. That's just setting up the stage. You don't have to use any of those numbers, but it gives your boss some idea of what the growth has been. Um, another thing that can be really, really useful it doesn't work so well for Walmart, but those those annual CAGR numbers are you seeing a trend? So you have a you have a firm like a, like a Sprouts because they're a smaller company. Maybe they're growing really fast now. Maybe they're growing forty percent, then thirty percent, then twenty five, then twenty two, then eighteen. You notice fast growth, but it's not as fast as it has been. They went from having a hundred stores, now they have five hundred stores, and now they have a thousand. You know, there's the growth. It's going to be fast, but the, the speed of the growth is going to decline. You don't see that with Walmart because they're all over the place. But for some, especially smaller firms, you, you notice that they're just they're growing fast, but not as fast as they've been doing. So the annual growth rate can be really, really helpful as well. The second thing was the PEG ratio. So we have the PEG and the PE ratio. So here's where we may have some data issues, but we'll see. So here you go under statistics. And under statistics, you get the PEG ratio, 376. And the PE ratio, use the forward PE ratio, 2212. And so what's the growth rate? You just take the PE ratio divided by the PEG divided by 100. That gives you the growth rate implied over the next five years. Now, could that be your assumption? Well, if you agree with every analyst out there, yeah, that's a good assumption. Because <laughs> that's what the average analyst thinks. But if that's all you do, then your boss says, well, I can just save $700,000 and I'll just use annual assessments. So don't tell your boss that. You can use them, just don't tell your boss. Otherwise they say, why am I paying you? You just can use annual assessments. I still remember at USA, I was, I was a security analyst for nine months and then I got called back to the investment side, the investor strategy side. I was standing outside of the uh, head of equities a guy named Harry he came out of his office and said, yeah, sometimes I like to come out and talk to our analysts to see what they're thinking. I was like, I didn't say anything to him. He probably saw my face and was like, what are you talking about? You got 50 people out here. You're paying them a fortune. You're not talking to them. I mean, why, why do you have these people? But he didn't use them. He used street research. It's like, what are you? I, I never could figure it out. Why does USA have all these analysts? No one ever listened to them. It's like a huge waste of money, isn't it? If you're not going to use your own analyst. So make sure you have an opinion that's more valuable than what's on the street, but you want to know what the street's thinking. 5.88%. That's a pretty high growth rate for Walmart. Um, and then sustainable growth. Remember on this one, you need ROE and retention. Retention is one minus the payout. So the peg ratio on the four PE, you get that's from the stats page. This you get from the stats page as well. So ROE, return on equity, there's our theory, 12.84%. The payout, we can get that as well. There it is, payout ratio, 52.46%. And so what's our retention? Retention is just one minus the payout. And then what's your sustainable growth? Your sustainable growth is your ROE times ROE times your retention.
Now, can we get this better? Yeah, you definitely could. With capital IQ, you might bring in several years worth and look at it. So you might, you might normalize. What does normalize mean? You just you look at the last several years and you want to make sure that the last year is not unusual. Now, right now, Walmart looks pretty reasonable. But if I went back a year or two ago, their ROE was massive because of COVID. You know, you're talking about 20, 30% ROE, something that's probably not the right number. So right now, the 6-1 is probably okay for Walmart. But if I got an unusual number, go back and look at several years. You can just take the median of the last five years, those kind of things, you know, anything that helps you. Here it works even for a firm that doesn't pay dividends because that just means the payout is zero, so the retention is 100%. So their sustainable growth is the same as their ROE. All right, in my opinion, what are we going to use here? Completely subjective. It's just your opinion. You get, you've got some information, recent strong growth, long-term weak growth. The market thinks you're going to grow about 6%. The sustainable growth with reasonable numbers about 6%. I'll say 6.5%. And why? I'm going to say some strong strategies related to curbside and online plus large store um, access, you know, something like that. So I think Walmart has an advantage over, over Amazon in that there's a lot of Walmarts out there. People are doing more curbside and ordering online. Walmart's doing stronger there. They bought jet.com. They're doing better. They are doing some pretty amazing things. I'm really quite impressed with Walmart and their ability to readjust. You know, this isn't some, some stodgy old company can't adjust. They're making some pretty good strides. Although someone today said that Kroger's is doing home delivery in San Antonio. Is that true? They don't even have a store here. So that's really bizarre. Have you used it before, Amanda? Well, I was looking at it. I was interested. I knew they didn't have a store there. Yeah. Where is this? Isn't that strange? So some warehouse, I don't know if you can go to the warehouse and bit by there. So that's an interesting thing. So when a firm does something strange like that, I'm curious. I mean, I saw Kroger's once that had a daycare. I go, that's interesting. I think some people might go shopping just to get the daycare, but I don't think charge for it. If that was a revenue center or if they're just trying to attract people. If it worked, the problem is if it works, what happens? Walmart does it, HEB does it. It doesn't get you anything. It just costs you more money. But um, so I, I watch those kind of things. Curbside is interesting. I have not used curbside yet. I haven't done home delivery yet. Um, Amazon's interesting and they have all the trucks. Are they going to start doing groceries in their trucks? You know, so, so I'm going to use six and a half. But here, you just got to write it up. It's your opinion. As long, I'm not looking for whether I agree with you or not. It's whether you have good logical arguments for why you think. This might be the entire reason you pick a particular company. What company can you make the most convincing story on short-term growth? Because that makes it a lot easier uh, to write the paper because that is the hardest thing. The rest of this is pretty easy to do. All right, any questions on short-term growth? Because that's, that's a pretty important one. So we use six and a half. Then the H, all right, this H is the hardest part where most students probably half the class get zero credit on the H. Fortunately, it's the lowest weighted, so it doesn't kill you on your paper. So let me show you what students write for which they get no credit. I think it will take six years to get from short-term to long-term growth. So Age is three. Why don't you get any credit for that? What number do I need you to explain in that? Or did you get the six? <laughs> All right. So you tell me six years. Why, why six? Why not four? Why not eight? 
So that doesn't work. So what do you need to do? It's called creative writing. You've got to find some way, some basis coming up with the year. I can't tell you much. One thing I will say, though, is an H of five is pretty long period. I mean, a 10. So what we're talking about here with the H, think of H as the half-life. What we're saying is, how long is it going to take to get from the 6.5% growth to the 4.5% growth? Whatever that number is, divided by 2 is our H. So if it's going to take us 6 years to get from 6.5 to 4.5, then our H is 3. All right, so H, just realize that H of 5 is pretty long, even for fast-growing companies. You look historically, even the fastest companies after out there, they grow fast for about 10 years and then it starts getting really tough to grow those, those 30, 40%. So an H of more than five, you're getting out there pretty extreme. Walmart, I guess the question is this curbside, this online, they're still adding a few stores, but they're getting pretty saturated. You know, I could argue Latin America, growth, you know, those kind of things, then you just kind of ask how long is it going to take for them to fully, fully execute that particular plan. McDonald's a few years ago was really interesting because most of their growth was converting company-owned stores to franchises, and it was creating massive growth. Well, it's pretty obvious if they're doing 10% a year, that's not going to take 12 years. <laughs> you run out of stores to, to, trans, to transfer them. Uh, uh, to change. So um, sometimes it's pretty obvious. Other times, who knows? How long is it going to take them? So you just kind of create a writing. I'm going to say H of uh, 2.5. I'm going to say five years, but I'm not going to tell you how I came up with that because that's not going to help you. I don't know enough about Walmart to say what that is. But this just some creative writing. Make some stuff up. If you can find some basis, maybe your company, maybe you're doing Lululemon. And they sell a lot to um, to women of certain age, but now they're trying to sell more than men. And you say, hey, I think they're going to pick up more of the men market over the next five to six years and whatever. You have just some basis for that discussion. How are they going to get there? Um, <clears throat> all right. So once you get there, you've got everything you need. Then you see the valuation and dividend discount model, H model, half earnings model, you just plug them in. It's real simple. Dividend zero times one plus long-term growth divided by KE minus long-term growth. Pretty straightforward. So dividend zero is 225 times one plus four and a half. Divided by KE, where's my KE? 617 minus four and a half. Oh, whoa, what did I do wrong? Ah. So I get 140. And we do the H model, the H model, exact same formula. We add this middle section in dividend zero times H times short term growth times long term growth. The teams did well on this. So if you look at the, uh, the teams, It's still between team one and two, and they're right on top of each other. So it's really, really close. Do y'all wanna know who's in third place? Do y'all know what team number you are? <laughs> so right now, team seven's in third place, but very close to team four. Could team three catch team one and two? It's conceivable. So we'll see, we'll see which team. 
a lot of stress on teams one and two, right? Now they got to really make sure they, 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 they're prepared. All it takes is one slip up and boy, they could switch it pretty, pretty quickly. All right. So here we're going to use the same formula we use for giving a discount model. But we're going to add this middle section plus dividend zero times H times short term growth minus long term growth. I don't know how many parentheses to put. 147.71. I'm going to double check that to make sure. Take out all that beginning section. 674, 674, so that's that's right. You get a negative number, you know it's wrong. That probably means that your growth is too high. Remember, your growth can't be higher than your KE, so double check that. You got to switch something. Or you might have a math error. Remember here, the math error students make here is they don't put all of this in the, in the numerator. They forget to put the parentheses in the right place. That's why I see that check digit's a good way to check and double, you know, make sure you did it correctly. And then the last one is the cap earnings, which looks a lot like dividend discount model, except we use earnings per share and we use inflation instead of dividends and long-term growth. So earnings per share was 428 times one plus inflation divided by AE minus inflation. Should give you the lowest value, but it won't always. It just depends on the company. So here you get the lowest value because essentially what we're saying, that's what Walmart's worth, but they don't open any more stores. They just stick with right where they are today. So now I've got some valuations. What else might I want here? What about the current price? That might be useful. So what is the current price for Walmart? 149.52. And then what do you do these valuations? You could take the average, you could take the median, I'll probably the median. This is gonna be the 140. So my recommendation might be old or uh, weak sell stock is slightly overvalued. How much is it overvalued? Well, it's going from 149.52. I think it's worth 140.96. So it's about about six percent. I don't usually say a sell if I think a stock is six percent more value because it's pretty close. Uh, I don't think I'm, my assumptions are so perfect. You know, I could change my growth rate by 0 0.01 and it would radically change this. Well, it depends on how skewed it is. Remember, averages are very skewed. You could do both. This one's really skewed because these two values are real close, which they're probably going to be, and that one's much lower. So the, the average is going to be much lower. It does either Either is fine. Now, if you really want to get into this, what you could do is run, run scenarios. If you take my secure analysis class, that's what we do. They actually do an entire data table where they have just hundreds of scenarios. You can certainly do that if you want to, you want to try that. It's not a bad approach. So the question, if you do that, like on a dividend discount model, let's think about it. So the beta we're using for this firm was 0.6, but remember it's been much, much lower than that. What's the highest beta I would ever use for Walmart? Or I think 0.8 is probably the highest I would go. And how low would I go? 
maybe 35. I don't think I'd ever go below that. So there's my beta scenarios. What about growth? Well, let's say they just keep up with inflation. What's the highest growth that would go with, with them? Maybe my economic growth, somewhere around that. What did I use for economic growth? Um, five and a half, maybe I'll go that high. That's gonna be a little big stretch for them. So what valuation does that give me? Well, I'll do equal. I do the dividend count model. 225 times one plus four and a half divided by my risk free rate plus my market risk premium times my beta minus my long term growth. So I put that there, there's my 140.96. And then what I wanna do is a, a data table. Have y'all done data tables before? I know how they work. I'm not a big fan of data tables. But you can do it without doing the data table. You can't just set it up as a formula. But data, what if analysis data table. So my input cell is beta. So I go find beta. My column is growth, long-term growth. And there I got it. So I just, I now have 150 scenarios. <laughs> How long did that take me to do 150 scenarios? So what I'm going to do is I'm going to conditional format it. If the values are greater than the current price, I want it to be green, right? Because that means I think it's a cheap stock. If my values are less than the current price, I want it to be red. And then what else do I want? Well, here's where you can uh, put your own in. If my value is less than zero, black font, black fill. What else might I do? Are there some value? Now, this one thing, if you're real careful with your boss, I've had bosses like that. Your boss sees at 10,271 and he says, you think Walmart's worth $10,000 or no, That's just an extreme number. So at what value would you say, you know what? I just don't want my boss to see that. So you might say my max, I'm gonna put say $500. I don't, I don't want 500 in this table anywhere. So then I go, if it's greater than, 500, hopefully this will work. Sometimes I'll do it in the wrong order. You have to do it in the right order. Hopefully I didn't mess it up, we'll see. Yeah, there you go. So now I have some pretty good scenarios that I can use. I don't want this showing up, so I'll change that to white. Uh, so if you wanted to put something like this in your paper, I would certainly give you credit for doing a little extra analysis. The next thing is my base case was 0.6, and I forgot, 0 0.6 and four and a half, 0 0.6 and four and a half. So there's, there's where I am. I might say, you know, my, this is my, kind of my expected range. In my expected range, they're mainly overpriced. There's a few scenarios where they look 
they look good, but they're mainly overpriced. A table like this is really quite powerful. Even more powerful, if any of y'all will really want to get out there and try it, is to do a, a football chart. I don't know if any of y'all have done football charts before, but football charts are great for paper like this. Since you watch you do, maybe you have three models that you do different assumptions, and that gives you a range for each model. And then you put the current price right in there, and you're trying to see is the current price to the right of my models or to the left? So that's another approach. So there's many, many different ways to do it. Now you might say, wow, well, I'm going from 45 bucks to 500 bucks. That's a really wide range. And yeah, that's probably the correct range, I think, too. We used to do the sector wars competition and one of the judges, he got real mad at one team because they had too many valuations and it was too wide. He said, no, that doesn't make sense. No one should do that. I, dis I disagree with him. And in fact, the uh, paper we were given on stock analysis was a mark and they had several hundred scenarios and the ranges were really, really wide. I actually think this is the true case of what, um, you know, I don't, I don't think their beta is 0.8 and I don't think the rose is 2%. So yeah, I, I don't, a lot of these numbers I would say are well out of my range, but who really, really knows what Walmart's gonna do next 100, 200 years. So, but, it gives you the full range and then you have a pretty good mix. You want to make sure if you do this, though, that this block is somewhat in the middle of your table. You don't want to way off on the right or left somewhere. So that's something else you can do. So I'm not telling you what you have to do, but you can certainly get more creative and get more powerful uh, stock like this, uh, uh, analysis like this. Now, if you take my security analysis class, they do they do the football chart as part of that chart. So in that class, we go much more extensive into this and they're required to do scenarios. So you don't have to do scenarios. You can just stick with the three. Make sure you have something that is what we call your target price. You'll notice that when you look at uh, an analysis like JP Morgan or Deutsche or whoever, They'll have a target price, and then I'll talk about where the current price is and what their recommendation is. So make sure you have some target price. Make sure you have the current price in there, and make sure you have a recommendation, all right? Those are all three very, very important. Some students, I've had papers where the current price is in, isn't anywhere in the paper. That makes no sense. You would never do this analysis and not talk about where the stock's currently trading. That would just be really strange. And then you've got to have a recommendation. Now, some of y'all gave me a recommendation in paper too. I'm not sure how you did that because you didn't do evaluation. So maybe you're giving me a recommendation. You know, there's there's a difference between good company, bad company, and good stock, bad stock. Is it possible to be a good company and a bad stock? Absolutely. It's a great company, it's grossly overvalued. Can you be a bad company and a good stock? Yeah, maybe that's where Macy's is right now, right? Macy's is a really, really cheap stock. Why? Because they're in malls. No one wants to go to malls. It's just, but they're really, really cheap. So you probably don't have Best Buy's, are they cheap right now? As best, uh, uh, I'm sorry, Bed, Bed Bath & Beyond. Is that a good company or a bad company? Pretty obviously bad company. But are they a good stock? Probably not. They're probably going out of business, so probably not a good stock. I don't know what their stock price is, but it's probably pennies now, isn't it? I always get them in Best Buy mixed up. So 28 cents, that sounds cheap, doesn't it? Um, they don't have a PE ratio because they're not making money. But I mean, you could have made a, a lot of money right here. They went from uh, 23 cents the 31 cents, but so that sounds like a bad company, bad stock. This is probably worth zero. So 23 cents for something that's worth zero. Google, Alphabet, those type of companies. Yeah, those are good companies, no question. Microsoft, great companies. They produce an incredible amount of free cash flow, but they're also pretty expensive companies. Meta, when I bought Meta, I bought it just because. It's a struggling company. It's got some problems, but boy, it was so cheap there. When its PE ratio fell down to 10, I was like, my word, 10 PE for Meta? I'll, I'll take that. 
Um, Macy's, you might not even be able, be able to. Uh, where is Macy's? There it is. Look at that PE ratio, four. That means if they don't grow their earnings at all, you'll get all your money back in four years. That's a pretty cheap stock. Uh, compare that to a Tesla with a 51 or a Zoom with a 193. You have to pay $193 for $1 earnings for Zoom. Macy's, you only have to pay $4. So very, very cheap stock. But is Macy's, if you think Macy's going to still be in business in 10 years, it's a really, really cheap stock. They don't have to do much. Maybe their earnings is fall, it will fall because they have to close down some stores, but still, they don't have to do much. Zoom has to be almost perfect. And I think Microsoft is starting to try to come back in. Don't y'all think Microsoft with Skype and some other things and Teams, UTSA uses Teams now. I don't know why. To me, they're all horrible. I hate them all, but uh, they're all equally horrible. So I don't know why you use Teams versus Zoom versus Skype. I use Skype. That's kind of my irritation. I keep switching. I use Skype for my Spanish classes. I use Teams for my UTSA meetings. I use Zoom for my classes. I can't tell them apart. Is there any that's obviously better than the other? Is there a new one that's going to come in that's going to be better? What would you do to become the next video conferencing firm that everybody else isn't doing? Y'all know why I hate Zoom, right? That right there, that, I hate that more than anything else. Why would you pick the escape key of any key? Um, but the market's essentially saying, I mean, they're, this is a great company. It's going to do great. It's priced almost for perfection. Yeah, so you maybe a good company. I don't know if it's a good company or not, but it could be a bad stock. So... Paper two, you're really in this good company, bad company analysis. You really couldn't speak to the stock. It's hard to say without doing some valuation whether the stock was good or not, but you could certainly talk to a good company or bad company. If you want to use the same company for papers three and four that you did for paper two, that's that's possible. Uh, Adobe, some of y'all did Adobe. Adobe is obviously a very good company, but a, a, kind of a, a high price company, but is it a good stock or not? So, you know, look at uh, Hieronymus' team. They, they said it looked like a pretty decent stock, not, not too much, uh, not, not expensive, uh, kind of a cheap stock. So that's your final conclusion you're going you're gonna to do in your paper. All right. So that's papers three and four. This is a very common paper to do. <laughs> this is like, this is fundamental to finance. Every finance student should be able to do what we're doing in three and four. Well, the target price is what you decide. So you've got three valuations, so you can't have three target prices. I made my target price the median of those three, but you have to find some way to say what you think. You might say my target price is 147.71 because I think that's the best model. Target price of what you think the company's worth. Yeah. The different the H model, it wouldn't make sense if they, they sort of like would be easier to get a range for H. So I do take a fixed number with a lot of confidence versus like a range. Well, the problem with the H model in this context is there's too many moving parts. Uh, in my security analysis class, I show them how to do a data table with H, but I'm doing multiple things. So what I actually do with the H model, you wouldn't want to do this because it's 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 a lot of work. But I do the H, the long term, and the short term. And I do many scenarios here, and that gives me one number here, and then I do my table off of that. But it's it's quite a mess. I don't do the actual data table though. I actually do a I do a I do a form one. You can do this data table just by doing formulas. You don't have to get, because the horrible thing about this is if you hit edit and you try to change anything, it's it's going to give you an error message because it's a table. So, yeah, now, now I can't get out without hitting escape. So see, it's like Bill Gates versus Zoom. They're both against me. So you don't have to use a data table. I don't like it because of that one thing. I prefer to do the formula. You can do the formula just by doing this formula, but putting dollar signs, you know, locking in and then having it 
come over here for the two and up here for the 0.8. So you can do this exact same thing, but without having to use a data table. So with the age model, that's what I do is I have my three assumptions. I see what that gives me. I then sort it from lowest to highest, and then I do I do it in there. But yeah, I mean, it's it's true. Your age might be zero and, and up to five. Your long-term might be whatever, short-term. I just do all those combinations and I get this gives you a much wider table, but you can certainly do that. Other questions on three and four? Now, if you want to use one of the Kappa IQ models, you can certainly do that. Just be careful on the assumptions. One I saw a team use the other day, the risk-free rate, I think it was using the three-month treasury. But it's real easy to change that. You just go to the pharma and tell it use the 10 year instead of the three month. So you can certainly do that. You need to put your own beta in there. You need to put your own market risk premium. So you just go find those cells and then you change it uh, for, for whatever assumptions you have. What I usually tell students to do, if you're going to use one of their models, Let's say they have this formula in there. Rather than deleting the formula, what I like to do is just take the formula, multiply by zero, and then put your own assumption in there. That way, you still have the formula in case something gets messed up, and you can you can adjust it. So, the thing I like about the Cap IQ is they they use more of the standard uh, kind of. Um, investment bank type of models, but you need to use these three models, but if you want to add a fourth one, you know, there's, there, I would certainly give you credit for, for doing other, other stuff. How much of this should you be able to do off the top of your head? Any guesses on that? 100% off the top of your head without any notes, look anything up. What do you know as a finance major? This is pretty basic standard stuff. How do you value a company? Pretty basic stuff. All right. I'll put this spreadsheet out there on, on Blackboard, but it, uh, this is not your paper. Don't, don't turn in a uh, Excel file to me. You need to put it into words and, and make it look fancy. I'll show you a paper three and four in a future class from a, a previous student. All right, so Bill Gates served me bad mouthing him, so he's now not working. All right. I don't know why that's taking so long. All right. All right, so what we're going to do, I want to induce this part to you. we got a few minutes here. I'm going to do a little portfolio management here, just high-level stuff, and then we're going to do relative value on Wednesday. So what we have left is relative value on Wednesday. We'll probably finish that on Wednesday, maybe in the next Monday, and then we'll get into options. So we get the rest of the semester on option. Those are your last two exam questions. Y'all notice on the prep exam, the tutorial for the 18 questions, you saw that entire video. That entire video is a practice video for exam two. So you can use that to practice the exam two. So we only have two questions that we haven't done yet. Well. Question one a little bit, we'll see, we'll get into that. So let's talk some portfolio management just real quickly today and a little bit in the next class. So you wanna start your own portfolio, you absolutely should start your own portfolio, even if it's a paper portfolio. If it's a paper portfolio, find a, find a, uh, a broker that allows for paper portfolios like Ameritrade, Ameritrade I think lets you go for 30 days or 90 days, I forget how long. But my guess, if you run out of time, just use another email account and create a whole new account and just start all over again. Um, Bloomberg has their portfolio. We've, we've been studying it and we've, we finally have figured it out somewhat. You can do Bloomberg. We haven't gotten our video to work yet because we lost the audio on the first one. We might create, recreate that. I'll see what Jacob wants to do on, on Tuesday. We might create a video that allows you to learn how to do Bloomberg's portfolio. It's, it's a little tricky, but once you, once you learn it, it's not too bad. Um, one thing about the Bloomberg is you can create a portfolio in Excel and then take that whole thing and copy it and paste it into Bloomberg and do all types of analysis. It's pretty cool stuff. So I'd strongly recommend 
that you do that, um, especially before you interview the jobs so you can talk about that. Yeah, I use Bloomberg's portfolio analysis. In real life and with real money for a stock portfolio, you're really gonna need, if you're gonna buy individual stocks, you probably need 100 to 150,000 at a minimum. You could get away with 30, 40,000. It just it gets a little tricky. It, now that Google split their stock, it's not so bad. But when Google was trading for you know two, three thousand dollars, you have a thirty thousand dollar portfolio. If you want one share of Google, that's ten percent of your portfolio, so you don't have much much leeway there. So one hundred fifty thousand, um, or if you have two or three thousand, then you can do mutual funds. Most mutual funds had a minimum of two or three thousand. Or one nice thing about a mutual fund is um, if you do their uh, Roth IRA or IRA, a lot of them will have minimums of only $50 if you do it monthly investing. Or you can have $1,000 and you can do ETFs. So that's, remember with an ETF, you can buy one ETF, but it has hundreds of stocks in it. So you can get a well diversified portfolio just by an ETF. An ETF is just whatever the price of the ETF is. So like the S&P 500, the SPY, that's a $400 ETF. So if you have $1,000, you can buy two shares of that and you have the entire US stock market. So, so much, much less if you're doing mutual funds or ETFs, but if you're doing individual stocks, where you're gonna buy individual stocks, you're probably gonna need at least $150,000. Bond portfolios, you need millions you can do bond portfolios. 50 million is probably too small. I would even say someone with 50 million, they're better off going to a mutual fund. For a few reasons. First of all, $50 million, you're not going to get great pricing. You're probably going to you're going to probably have to pay the same fee you would if you just bought their mutual fund. 50 million is more of a hassle for them. It's just not worth it. Plus, bonds, especially corporate bonds, are usually bought in million dollar blocks. You don't go out and buy, put $20,000 into a bond. It just doesn't make sense. So you're much, much better off buying mutual funds or buying insurance products from banks and life insurance companies. So bond mutual funds is probably, now you can do bond ETFs. They're perfectly fine as well. There are ways I do a lot of bond ETFs now. That's a much smarter way to go than um, try to buy individual securities. Just watch the fees. So we just talked about this good company versus good stock. So what is your what is your strategy or is your philosophy? So we'll, we'll get into this next class, but there's four things that you need. All right. You need a philosophy. Your philosophy starts with the words, I believe. You need a process for how you're going to find those stocks that are consistent with your philosophy. You need construction. So you say, here's the 50 stocks that meet my, my, my philosophy. Am I gonna put 1 50th in each one? Am I gonna have some kind of model to decide how I allocate? So how are you gonna put it together? And then you need risk management. You need those four things. I'd recommend before you interview for a job that you have that written out, those four things written out so you can talk about them. And I would really recommend plagiarism not good, but in this case, plagiarism is perfectly fine. Go copy somebody else, but put it into your own words. Go find a bond, a stock por a portfolio, some mutual fund, and go look at their perspectives and see what their strategy is. You've know, heard of Kathy Woods with ARC. You can go to Kathy Woods' website. I don't know how to spell Kathy, but we'll see. There she is. Arc Disruptive Innovation. What does that mean? Aims to provide broad exposure, disruptive. In so there's some philosophy. They want to buy. They want to buy shares of companies that are changing the world. They're doing something radical. So what is that? It could be artificial intelligence. It could be electronic vehicles. It could be batteries. It could be 3D printing. We're looking at a firm that does 3D printing of body parts. That's pretty cool, isn't it? It's like, hey, I'll send you a liver. Uh, I got it in the software. Hopefully there's no errors in the software. 
Um, it could be carbon capture, whatever. And that's what they're doing. So you can see the kind of things they have, artificial intelligence, robotics, energy storage, DNA sequencing, blockchain. Those are the kind of things that they're doing. That could be your strategy. That is these disrupting companies that are gonna be the fastest growing. That's where the value is gonna be. Part of my philosophy with disruptive is you don't have to be all that right. You only have to get one right. So you know, 40 or 30 years ago, you could have bought 20 companies. 19 of them could have gone out of business and lost 100%, and one of them could have been Microsoft and you would have made a fortune. That's, that's the nice thing about disruptive innovation. You only have to be right one out of 20 times to make a fortune. So you got pretty good odds there of you know, doing well. And then you, you spread it over a lot of different bets. 3D printing, there's a lot of opportunities there. Uh, we haven't heard much about that, but think about that. We, didn't, we heard a lot about artificial intelligence, then it disappeared. And then it came back with a vengeance this year. 3D printing. We heard a lot about 3D printing, and now it's quiet. It's probably going to come back with a vengeance again. FinTech, that's a big one. Um, autonomous vehicles, that's another one. We heard all this rumor about it, and then suddenly it kind of just kind of died. So each one of these have their own kind of history, their own S-curve. That could be your philosophy. We'll talk about some philosophies. GARP is a really popular one, but just find one and copy it and make it your, put it in your own words. I'm working with a high school student. I'm his mentor. He's going to do a core and satellite approach. So his core is going to be GARP. Why GARP? Because that's the easiest one. And anybody know what GARP stands for? G stands for, what do we love as stock investors? Growth. Growth. P stands for, what did we just calculate? Our target price, so growth and price. So growth at a reasonable price. We want growth, we won't overpay for it, all right? So that's GARP. His second strategy, which is gonna be a satellite, is gonna be an ARC disruptive innovation strategy. So that's what he's gonna do. So we're putting that together as his pitch book. He's gonna create a pitch book. And it's going to have his philosophy, his process, his construction, his risk management. So he's putting all, and he's a high school kid. So he's, you know, years ahead of all of his competition. So we'll, we'll walk through this. All right, we'll start this next class. I'll walk you through how to do this. Last class, I started portfolio management, but we're going to do a detour, not really a detour, do relative value analysis. I didn't want to start relative value, but we'll get back to portfolio management. We really have relative value portfolio management and then uh, derivatives left. Those are the only topics. We'll probably have three more team questions. We need to do one team question on the beta and cap M. We'll probably do that next Monday. And then we have a team question on relative value analysis and a team question on derivatives. And that will cover all the team questions and the entire second exam as well. So um, some examples of some paper three, four examples. Here's one on Texas Instruments. They started off this abstract describing the company. It's a little bit lengthy for an abstract, but describing the company. Then coming up to the discount rate, CAPM, um, talking about the risk-free rate. They did put a chart in there, which I think is helpful with treasuries. Last class, interest rates are already starting to rise. So if you wanted to show that in perspective, the market risk premium, yeah, you're, you're normally going to see these these charts in there as well. Someone was asking about the buyback yield. If you want to put that in there, I can send you the file I use. It's It's been higher than dividend yield, but then it's much more volatile. So it probably dropped in 2022. I haven't updated it yet for 2022 because I can't get all the data yet. So it probably dropped off. So it was in 2008, it went negative. Whereas dividend yields didn't go negative, obviously they can't, but they fell. But um, so it's it's been higher, but it's much more volatile. So when you have a tough year like 2022, if we're going to recession, you're likely to see it actually go negative. So it, it can fluctuate around. So you don't want to use the last couple of years where it's really, really high, like one and a half percent, because that's probably going to be too high. But if you want to put that in your paper, it's it's not a bad thing to put it into your paper because it avoids the discount rate being lower than your growth rate issue. Um, 
So quite a bit of discussion about productivity and labor growth and those type of things. And then the beta is real straightforward. Revenue, operating leverage, make sure operating leverage is not just the chart, but it's also the subjective side of what, what's the fixed cost nature of this business. So you want that in there as well. Financial leverage is a fairly easy one. One thing I like that you can definitely do in operating leverage is find a, a similar company and see if the leverage is the same. If you're doing a company like Home Depot, is the volatility of their, their net margins the same as, as the lows? You know, that, that can be insightful just to make sure you're not seeing some wild numbers because something strange happened. So there's our paper three and then paper four. They gave all the assumptions up front. It kind of looks better in a table, but they got all their assumptions. You obviously you have to justify those. So all of those assumptions that you have need to be justified. He did some historical growth. Um, he did the uh, peg ratio. Has a little discussion on the high path life, how you come up with that. The inflation number, which he already talked about before. And then he just has the models. He puts the formula in there, which is, is fine. I do like this so I can, I actually calculate all of the numbers, but I have it set up. So if you have your numbers, I'll just plug them in and I'll make easy the number and then I can make sure that you don't have an error. If you do have an error that looks pretty pervasive, I'll probably email you and let you know that you need to fix that before the exam because you're you're making the same mistake over and over again. So um, like some people use three instead of 3%, well, obviously that's gonna be like 300%. So just some basic stuff like that happens. Um, and then at the end, his final conclusion, buy, sell, or hold. And he has all the prices and the current price. And so there's, there's Texas Instruments. Interesting company. It's kind of the quiet company, right? It's just out there doing their thing over and over again. And, doesn't get a lot of press, but it seems to be a pretty solid company that has its niche. Um, another paper. So they, they did Nike and they started off with a little bit of background on the current price and what the stock price has been doing. That's not a bad thing to add in your paper is the year to date stock price. Uh, a lot of times, you like to see it in context. So if you say, hey, I think that we were just doing Adobe and we're getting valuations of Adobe at like $500 or so. And when you get a valuation of $500, when the stock's trading for say maybe 375, it's sometimes interesting to look at the 52 so, hey, I think it's worth 500. It's never traded 500 before. So that would be an all time high. Or if you think it's worth 425, well, it was above 425 not that long ago. So that doesn't seem unreasonable. Doesn't mean the number is right or wrong, but it just gives you some context of it. And so when you do a year to date chart, you say, hey, I think it's worth $500. Someone's going to say, wow, you how come? Yeah, that seems awfully uh, optimistic or. So it, it, it's a way to put some in, in context. Um, is it? You never know which. So discount rate, obviously risk free rate. They, they did a graph as well. Market risk premium, very similar stuff, right? Paper three is very similar. Productivity, labor growth. They even put a quote in there from somebody. Make sure on productivity and labor growth and inflation, we're talking the next 50 years. Don't go find some forecast for 2024. That's not what we're looking for. We're in the middle of a crisis, possibly one year, two year forecasts are meaningless to this type of valuation. We're going out to infinity. Then the beta determination should look really familiar. Revenue sensitivity, operating leverage, financial leverage. And then you, you have to do the beta chart. So you have the beta chart in there. And then they did the table. I really like having the table in there. They did a high scenario and a low scenario. Um, and then the valuation, very similar type of stuff. Um, 
Here they did um, a normalization on the uh, sustainable growth is a really good thing to do. They did a five year, 10 year average just to show you, um, you know, what, what you could expect over the long term. Obviously, high, high profitable firm. And then valuation did their models, gave me the formula, which really helps me a lot. And then final recommendation. They did percentage of the current price, which is not a bad way to do it um, because it's unlikely you're going to find a firm that's cheap on everything or rich on everything. So you can almost think of it as the upside is 60%, the downside is 21%. That's the norm. If you find a stock that your worst case scenario is you're going to make 50%, then your assumptions are probably a little, you know, if you're running scenarios, I say this in my uh, business finance class. If you run your cost benefit analysis and your worst case scenario on opening this franchise is you make millions of dollars, you're, there's something wrong with your assumptions. There's there's no stock, there's nothing out there to your worst case is you do extremely well. That's not the way finance is. So your worst case, you're gonna lose money. So uh, you, you can't have a pretty wide range there. And then the final recommendation, they're using the plural. You can say our, if you want. I, I, I think they're trying to get it so that it's, you know, it's JP Morgan and it's usually three analysts, but you can use that, you can use a singular pronoun, that's fine. So there's there's a paper. So it follows the paper description very closely. It's not, there's nothing radical going on there. It's just a matter of you putting the words there. I don't give you an example paper, mainly because it's especially paper three. There's so much stuff that you're all doing the exact same thing. So I don't want to, I don't want copying and pasting going on. All right. I forget when that paper is due, but it's not this week, I know. So I'll look on the calendar. I get at the end of the semester, everything's due all at once. So two classes, three classes. So, all right, let's talk relative value analysis. So Dante, you've seen this before, but hopefully, hopefully this is boring that you remember all of it. Do you want to do this presentation? No, you probably could. Working the investment side, we see this a lot. All right, so relative value analysis is very, very, very important. Everybody uses it. People who say they don't use it, they use it. Everybody, everybody's aware of this. It's not quite like with uh, technical analysis. Not everybody uses it, although most do. But um, relative value, very, very important. Um, so there's a lot of things we can do with relative value analysis. What I want to do is set up how it fits in with the other two approaches. Give a real estate example, because that's the way we normally think about relative value. Most of us with real estate, it's just really normal to do, just natural to do a relative value analysis. And then what should be in your relative value analysis? So, um, the, Ma the, damn, I the, the Madoran, oh, I can, I'll never say his name right again. The Damodoran is the way I say that's how he says his, his name. Um, he has a relative value uh, class that he teaches, and I stole a lot of my stuff from him because he does a really interesting approach. So he never taught relative value in his classes. He only taught it what you're doing in papers three and four. And his student says, yeah, that's all we need because that's what we're going to do. And then he, he decided to go ask his students and discover none of them were doing papers three and four, and they were all doing relative value. So he said, well, I guess I better at least teach relative value. So we at least do it correctly. That's that was his thing is if we're gonna all use relative value, let's make sure we're doing it correctly. So that's part of the implication was a lot of people were doing it incorrectly. Um, what are the most common price relatives? But then which price relative should you use based on your industry? And so that's what the exam question is. It's the one kind of, one of the few essay questions on the final exam, but, I'll give you some relative values. You got to first figure out if it's a good one or a bad one. So what's a good one, what's a bad one? And then you have to figure out what industry. So if you're doing a retailer, do you use price to earnings? Do you do EV the uh, sales? Do you do EV the EBITDA? Do you do price to book? If you're doing an insurance company, which do you do? People in the industry, it's pretty automatic. You say, oh, I'm looking at a bank. Oh, well, what's its price to book? Very, very obvious. I'm looking at lows. Well, what's their EV the sales? It's just so I want y'all to get that kind of second that second nature, so you know exactly what to look at. 
are you doing a tech company? Oh, what's their EV David dot? So let's get into this. So here's the three ways we tend to do analysis of stocks, fundamental analysis, which is your paper three and four. That's what paper three and four is, this kind of cash flow, growth rates. Technical analysis, we don't do in this class. I do one technical analysis, my secure analysis class. If you take that, there's one paper on that. I keep it pretty simple. It's the last paper and it's the easiest. And by that time, everybody's so burned out, they want something that's pretty straightforward. So it's fairly straightforward. Um, if you want to get into technical analysis, just type tech in a Bloomberg machine and their entire technical analysis comes up and it's pretty amazing what they have available. Uh, but we're not going to do it in this class. So we're going to talk about relative value analysis. You can use all of this at the asset class level. You can ask, is the stock market overvalued? You can use fundamental analysis, technical analysis, relative value analysis to ask that question. You can do it at the security level. Is Adobe overvalued? You can use all three of these to assess that. In fact, I was an asset strategist for much of my career, and yeah, we used, we used all of these. So what is relative value analysis? You're comparing some measure of value. So we're only, we're only gonna have two, price and enterprise value. And we're gonna compare that to some underlying fundamental factor, usually an accounting number, but it doesn't, you're gonna see with real estate, it doesn't have to be in an accounting number. So you have a market number versus some non-market number, some, some specifically assigned number. So our measures of value for us is gonna be price and enterprise value. Y'all know what enterprise value is? Well, the other way, but yeah, that's the question. That's the key. So let's, let's look at a firm. We got Adobe up here. So I think we have to go to statistics. They should put it on this first page, but they don't. So Adobe's market value, market cap is 159 billion. The enterprise value is 147. That's, I'm gonna show you why it's that in a second. Let me do Walmart because that's gonna be a little more straightforward. So Walmart's market cap is 388. The enterprise value is 442. That's the norm for enterprise value to be higher. And Dante's right, it has to do with debt. So market cap is the market value of the firm to the stockholders. Enterprise value is the market cap plus the debt of the firm. Now, is it book value or market value? It's probably going to be the book value of the debt. That's a big issue. If you take corporate finance from Catapacum, how do you treat debt? Is it market value or book value? Right now, it's a big deal because the market value of debt is probably you know, 10 cents cheaper than it was last year, 15 cents cheaper. But generally, market value and book value of debt is Pretty close. It's not usually radically off. So this is probably the book value of the debt of the firm. But it's not gross debt. So how in the world could Adobe's enterprise value be lowered its market cap? Because it's net debt. Net of what? What would you subtract from debt? Cash. Yeah. So if a firm has a lot of cash, it's possible for the enterprise value to be lower than the market cap. So a good example, well, it may not work with Apple, but we'll try it. Yeah, Apple, it's not right now, but it really is. And that's because Apple has like $200 billion in cash. They don't classify as cash. They've got it in longer term investments. But if they took all those long, you know, we're talking longer term, like one and a half year bonds. That moves from cash down to investments. But if they moved all up to cash, they would be, it would be lower. Microsoft might work. Yeah, so Microsoft, their market cap is higher than their enterprise value. So they have, they do have some debt, but they have more cash than debt. Why would someone have a million dollars in debt and when they have $1.3 million in cash? For these firms, it's because they don't want to bring money back from Europe and pay tax in the US. So they rather leave the cash in Europe, borrow in the United States, pay their dividends and avoid the tax hit. So that's the reason they do that. It doesn't make a lot of sense. I mean, if you got $1.2 million, don't go out and borrow a million dollars and have to pay all that interest. But these firms do that. All right, so for most firms, it's gonna be, um, it's gonna be 
big difference. You look at a firm like Duke, 79 billion and 154. Why? Because utilities have a lot of debt. That's just the nature of the utility. So generally enterprise value is a higher number, but not always. And that's gonna be important. It's extremely important that this includes debt. This is, this is only the stockholders. So you have to remember that at the end for a good ratio versus a bad ratio, do you want to include the debt holders or do you want to exclude the debt holders? And that depends on what you're dividing by. Is what you're dividing by include debt holders or exclude debt holders? So you got to keep those two consistent. So we're going to take some measure of value over some fundamental. For, for stocks, the most common is earnings, revenue, and book value. And I say earnings related because there's like three or four earnings related one. There are some very industry specific ones that we, we use. And I'll, I'll give you a few of those that are, are pretty common. I mean, a good example is BlackRock. What might BlackRock use instead of book value? What do you think is the most important number for BlackRock? You're evaluating them. AUM maybe, that's AUM. Assets under management, and what is it? They don't tell us. Assets under management, do they fall back below 10 trillion? Well, they fell well below 10 trillion, didn't they? Yeah, that's really bad. When your firm goes above 10 trillion, what's going to happen? Your, the market's going to crash because you write all the articles, hey, the first firm over 10 trillion, and then two weeks later, they're at 9.7 because the market crash. But yeah, they hit 10 trillion, which is pretty amazing. I want to know how much am I paying for this firm relative to the AUM? When USA sold off its investment arm to Victory Capital, that's the first thing I did. I did an enterprise value to assets under management. And I wanted to see how much were they paying versus BlackRock versus all these other firms. And I think they they got under, I think they they sold it for too cheap. I think they could have gotten more money out of that firm. Um, so I think they undersold. Why? Because of that valuation. You can do the same thing with a Vanguard. The problem with Vanguard is it's not a couple of Trump companies, so you can't do any valuation, but you can use if Vanguard were to ever go public. That 8.1 trillion would be your basis for figuring out how much they would pay. You look at how much BlackRock costs per their 8.9 billion. So you would think, you know, if BlackRock's worth whatever it is, that Vanguard's gonna be worth something pretty similar because they have about the same assets under management. It's pretty amazing how Vanguard's, you know, my favorite firm, but it's pretty amazing how fast they're catching up with BlackRock. I mean, Vanguard's not huge. I mean, why is BlackRock so big? Is that all organic growth? They bought a lot of firms, right? They bought all the ETFs from uh, Barclays. So BlackRock's huge because they bought all these other firms. Vanguard's huge, and it's all organically built. They built it all themselves. Pretty amazing firm. So BlackRock's uh, market cap is $100 billion. So Vanguard, if it went public, would probably be about a $100 billion firm. USA, when it sold the Victory Capital, it sold, oh, I don't know, like $80 billion in assets, really small. Um, what is that, 1,000, 100, 100, the size of BlackRock. So that would that gives you a sense of how much USA should have sold that for. For over a billion, I forget how much they sold it for, but, um, but that gives you a good indication. So there are other, other ones. Uh, I showed you Duke. Uh, utilities have a very different type of analysis than the other companies. So that's what we're going to do. So relative value accepts that markets are valued correctly if you're looking at individual stocks. And what we're trying to do is figure out if a particular asset is rich or cheap relative to everybody else. And we use that term rich and cheap. Cheap means it's inexpensive, rich means it's expensive. I wish we would change those terms, but um, cheap is good, rich is bad. Not if you're looking for a spouse, but if you're looking for a stock, cheap is good, rich is, rich is bad. 
All right, so let's do a real estate example. If you're looking for a house and the only information you have is that it's a $152,000 house. Are you gonna buy that house? No, have we covered this before? No, you are looking at me like, I already know this. All right, so why would you buy this house? That sounds like a pretty cheap house, doesn't it? Yeah, so we need more, a little more information, but well, let's say there's two houses in the same neighborhood and they recently sold one for 875 and another one 675. Will you buy it now? You would now for sure. What do you know about this house? There's got to be something wrong with it. Why would they be selling it for 150000 So you want to know what that was. But Adrian is probably thinking, I don't care if there's anything wrong with it. I'll tear it down and build a $700,000 house because I can probably get my money back somehow. All right, so let's do some relative value analysis. Let's say that this house costs $75 per square foot. And the other two houses, they sell for $215 and $225. Now, now is it interesting? You still know there's something wrong with the house, but it's awfully cheap. So it's not the size. It's not like the other houses were 5,000 square foot and this one was 20 square feet. So we have adjusted for something. So price per square foot is a price relative. What you're doing is you're taking a market value number and you're comparing it to some non-market value number and try to see if that market value number is too high or too low, all right? It's price per square foot, per square foot. Is this enough to get you to buy it? You still think there's something going on. So let's say we bring it, and there's actually a website out there that does exactly this. You find every factor people use in buying a house, and you put that in the model. Some are related, this is important, some are related to value and some are related to risk. It's the same thing with stocks. You want some factors related to value, some factors related to risk. And you bring all these, I don't, I don't know if I've got them all. I, I saw an article about this particular site and I forgot to write down the site. There are there are places you can go that do this kind of regression to try to figure out every single factor. And I'm sure I didn't pick up, pick up all the factors. But size of the house, which we're already gotten with the square feet, how good the landscaping is, the roof, um, just the quality of everything around. Um, you know, kitchen quality, that's a pretty big deal for a lot of people. My kitchen's so small, I wish I had more space in there. And that, that, you know, you spend a lot of time in the kitchen. So some people, that's pretty important. Um, the age of the floors, quality of schools, those type of things. And then on the risk side is, you know, is it going to flood? Are there foundation issues? When I saw my mom's house, it was a big deal. They had a foundation issue, but it had a guarantee. The guy who fixed it. And then I'm thinking, okay, this is the residential market. This, that firm's probably out of business. So I'll call them, they're still in business 30 years later. So I said, okay, I've got a guarantee and they're still in business. So I could tell the buyer, hey, you can, you have a guarantee from this firm that's still operating, still functioning. Uh, how close is a fire department, annoying neighbors? I don't know what else you can put in, in houses. If I was in California, I've already been, probably been worried about is the, is the land sliding into the ocean? Um, Where's the earthquake faults? Is there you know, flood plain is probably pretty important. Those are the kind of things you, you want to ask for. It's a lot easier to get risk when we're talking about a stock than it is on real estate, but you still ask that question. And let's say we put all those inputs together and we can get a 91% R squared looking at 350 houses that have been sold. And when we do that, this house should regression wise, based on all of its inputs, should be going for $150 per square foot but you can buy it for 75. Now do we have enough? So what would you do? You would probably look at this list, right? And make sure everything you thought was important in the list. There's some things on the list that are subjective, it's in quality, so you might be curious, how do they do that? You rank it one to five, what are you looking at? You might want that broken out. Um, but hopefully if you like this model, you have some confidence in it, 150 versus 75, that sounds like a really good house. Even if you don't like it, you decide to live in it, you can probably sell it for a better price a little later. Uh, 
But still, you know, deep down, this is true for stocks. You know, deep down, everything's saying this house should be going for 150 and yet they're selling it for 75. So there's still something going on here. Why aren't people buying it for 150? I mean, that's there's something wrong, isn't there? There has to be. Unless you found some house, no, no one else, you know, the realtor is really bad. They don't advertise very well and you don't, you don't help them out. It's like, you know, you, you, we have the internet now. You probably should be on the internet. Oh, no, I don't, I don't do that fancy stuff. You say, okay, fine, I'll buy the house for 75. Unlikely that's the case, but there could be something going on. Um, so it's, you're getting a little more confident. And that's the key with relative value is you want to figure out all the factors going in. But you notice what we're doing with this model is we're not valuing what you value. We're valuing what the market values. So that can have a huge impact. And let's say we figure out there's two things the market values that you don't care about. And that's the reason this house is going so cheap. And those two things were, has anyone ever been murdered in the house? And is the house considered haunted? You bring those two factors in, and there are houses that are considered. There's a lady in Hub Lotus. Well, last, they invite me to their uh, holiday party because I ride my bike there every day. And the last party, she was telling us about how their house was haunted. And I was going to laugh because I thought she was joking. Personally, I didn't. She was telling me she was serious. They have these paintings that are moving all over the place, all kinds of stuff. Really, this is a really good storyteller. It's a really great story, but I'm thinking, you know, you probably shouldn't be telling anybody this story if you ever want to sell your house. Has anyone ever been murdered in the house? I wouldn't care about that, but some people like, I don't want a house where there's been a major crime that's happened. Uh, so those are kind of things. When you do that, your R squared jumps up to 98. And when you do that, now the house should be going for 80. So now you know you got 150 without these two things and it dropped to 80 with them. So you know something has definitely happened in this house, but you don't care about that. Sure. It doesn't bother you. Uh-huh. Did you have to that information? So oh, I don't know. I'm not a real estate person. I saw a candid camera once. I thought it was pretty hilarious. The, the lady's showing the house and they have a chalk outline on the floor. And she's like, oh, just ignore that. And the, the buyer's like, well, wait, this seems kind of important. But I don't know. I wouldn't care. You know, I don't. I'm not worried about haunted houses. It could be a really friendly ghost, who knows. Um, so you now know something that is affecting the market value of the house, but you don't care about it. To you, you like the model. You think this house is worth 150, but there's something that makes it go for 80. So the question is, do you buy? Well, the question, question might be, how long do you live to plan to live there? You're gonna live there for a very, very long time, then yeah, buy the house for 75 because you think it's worth 150. You might be selling it in a year or two. You didn't have to recognize those other factors because when you sell it, the people buying it from you might are probably gonna care about those other factors. And that's the tough that we do this in investment society when we run our models during the fall semester, is we're trying to find those factors that are driving the price. But we may look at those factors and say, you know, that one's not important to me. I don't think. Why is the market so focused on that? And I want to take that factor out. You can, but you got to realize that the market's fact focused on it. They may still be focused on it the next time you try to when you try to sell the stock. So this is what relative value is. It doesn't ask is the housing housing market overpriced or underpriced. You can certainly do that with relative value. You can look at um, house prices per square foot over time and kind of compare that to inflation. Other things you can certainly do that. Try to see what's a what's an easy way to see if real estate's overpriced at, a, at an asset level. Well, there we talk we we do um, real estate versus rents. I don't know if I can find the ratio, but there's a ratio. Uh, I forget the name of the ratio, but you look at. Uh, real estate prices versus rents, there it is, the house price to rent ratio. They should be similar, shouldn't they? If houses are really expensive, people say, I can't afford a house, I'm gonna rent, what's gonna happen to the rent rates? They should shoot up. So the two should be related. What happens though if housing prices are shooting up but rental rates are staying the same? Is there too many apartments in the city or, or maybe the housing market's overpriced? Um, you can do that, I remember, when I made one presentation at USAA on the housing market, 
I was looking at California's housing market and the numbers were ridiculous. Um, I, I, I didn't do a, a house price to rent ratio because the numbers were so ridiculous. So I, instead what I did was a house price to five-star hotel rates, which would be more expensive, staying in a five-star hotel for a month or renting an apartment. The hotel would be pretty expensive, wouldn't it? I mean, an apartment you're paying 1,500 a month. I've, I've paid $1,000 at a hotel for a night. That's kind of an expensive hotel, right? So 1,000 a night versus 1,500 a month. But when I did that, California housing prices still looked expensive. You, you could have rented, you could have stayed in a five-star hotel and you would have been better off financially. Um, and so people were asking, you know, what should we do? Our housing price, and I said, well, sell the house. It's like, well, where I live, it doesn't matter. You can rent right now in California, right at that time, you're much better off renting than you were owning the house because the house price you could get was so huge. Our, my recommendation was sell your California house, come buy three houses in Texas, and you'll still have plenty of money left over for first class trips to California and you can visit all you want to. That's how expensive California houses have gotten, have gotten at that time. They're not that now because 2008 fixed a lot of that. But, but that is a rel that's somewhat of a relative value type of measure because rents are kind of, you know, fixed accounting kind of numbers. So we do this a lot in finance. It's a very, very helpful way to try to figure out what's going on with markets. So you can use it to look at the entire market overall, but right now we're focused on this individual house. Is it overpriced or over underpriced? So that's what a price relative is. What you want to do is pick the right relative for the industry. You want to make sure you have the right fundamentals in there, the right risk factors. You can have generic ratios that we tend to use for every industry, except for banking and insurance tend to have their own specific things for everything. And then you want specific ratios to your, to your industry. So all three have to be there, the correct price relative, the correct fundamental value, the correct measures of risk, those all need to be in, in the analysis. So essentially we're talking about a regressive analysis. Your fundamental factor, your risk factor, those are your independent variables. You're gonna use them to try to forecast what the appropriate relative is. And then you can decide, Say, well, this stock should have a PE ratio of 23, but its PE ratio is 32. This stock's too expensive. That's the kind of analysis you're going to do. The higher the fundamental values, the fundamental right value can be a return on equity, it can be earnings growth, it can be gross margins, net margins, asset turnover. The higher those are, the more expensive the stock should be. The higher the risk factor, risk factors can be debt to equity, debt to EBITDA, um, betas volatility of earnings, those kind of things. Those are risk factors. The higher the risk factor, the lower the value stock. We tend to forget this second one, which we're going to talk about that one. We tend to say, wow, high PE ratio, that must be a high growth company. But really? So I can show you the stock market's PE is right around 20. I can show you Walmart. Walmart's PE ratio is 35. That's a really expensive stock. Is the market saying Walmart is a really high growth company? Are they saying they're a really low risk company? Which do you think it is? Do y'all think of Walmart as a high growth company? Are you jumping, are you running to Walmart more today than you were three years ago? No, it's not a high growth company. What is it? It's a low risk company. So there are farms out there that are, here's a PE ratio of 205. Why is Zoom a 205 PE ratio? Because it's a high growth company, not because it's low risk, it's a high growth. So you, you have to put those both in there. If you don't do that, then you may be finding a company that you think is cheap, but it's not cheap, it's just really high. My debt load you could use the firm is a whole lot of debt. Or you can have a firm that you think is really, really expensive, and it might just be just really, really low risk, like a Walmart. So if you don't have both of those in your analysis, you're going to make some really, really bad decisions. 
All right, I love this table. Yeah, I, if I were a finance major, I'd carry this with me, or I would just learn it, just know it. So we've already done this first part. The value of a stock is this dividends divided by K minus G. Remember that the dividend discount model, I don't have the extra growth in there. Well, what is a dividend? A dividend is the earnings times the payout ratio. Do I agree with that? What if we divide both sides by earnings? What do we get? Oh, we get a PE ratio. What is a PE ratio? There it is right there. A PE ratio is what? It's the payout ratio divided by, what is this RF plus B times market risk premium? That's the capital asset pricing model. That's your discount rate. And what's the G? That's growth. So what does this formula tell you? RF is interest rates. What happens if interest rates rise? It's going to happen to your PE ratio. If you increase the denominator, what happens to the ratio? Come down. Are PE ratios higher? Interest rates are lower and lower interest rates are higher? Absolutely. When were PE ratios well below 10? In the late 70s. What was happening in the late 70s? We're really, really high in interest rates. All right, so there's definitely a very high correlation between PE ratios and interest rates. What's the market risk premium? That's how risky the stock market is. What happens when that goes up to PE ratios? Everybody's worried about the stock market being risky. Stock prices fall, PE ratios are gonna fall. These two relate to all stocks equally. There's nothing individual. So the RF and MRP, that's, that's the entire stock market, that's all stocks. The beta and growth are specific to the company. So what this is saying, when interest rates are high, when interest rates rise, PE ratios fall. When risk rises, PE ratios fall. When rates are low or risk is low, PE ratios are high. What about the company? If the company's risky, what is its PE ratio gonna be? Higher beta, lower PE ratio, right? What about growth? When growth is high, here we're subtracting growth. So if growth is high, the PE ratio will be high. That one goes in the same direction. Everything else, opposite direction. So this is telling you that a PE ratio is a reflection of the current level of interest rates, the current level of overall risk assessment, the relative risk of the company, and the, the growth of the company. All of that is in a PE ratio, every single one of those. Now, your firm may have a high PE ratio because interest rates are low, but then so will every other company. All right, so that just affects everybody. Your, your firm's PE ratio might be low because of the market risk premium side, but so is every other company. But we're comparing your company's PE ratio to another company's PE ratio, then the only thing you're looking at is beta and growth. Now, what's the one part of the equation I ignore? The payout, why did I ignore payout? Do you remember the uh, sustainable growth formula? Growth equals ROE times one minus the payout. What does that theory say? If you increase the payout, what happens to your growth? If you pay out more, you grow more slowly. Finance says these two are exactly related to each other. The more you pay out, the lower your growth. So if you increase this, you reduce that, and there's no impact on the PE ratio. Right, so we can ignore payout because it's directly tied to growth. That makes sense? Growth equals ROE times one minus payout. So the higher the payout, the lower the growth. I've seen people take this with price to book and EV to sales. So you can make these adjustments with other payout, but I would remember this. This is the whole key to uh, what relative value is all about. It's got uh, market, factors, it's got company specific factors, and there's factors on risk, there's factors from fundamentals, all of it's in there in that ratio. So these are numbers I haven't updated in a few weeks. So anyway, with Zoom's PE ratio 263, Walmart, wow, it must have been a few months since I've updated this, 21, Amazon 94, Ford 8. What is the market tell us, telling us? Is Ford cheap? Is Ford slow growth? Is Ford high risk? And the answer is 
could be yes, 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 no. Well, it's definitely yes, yes. I think Ford is a slow growth. Uh, I don't know what, what, is it the Ford Focus Leaf? Or is that, what EVs does Ford have? Is, is the Leaf a Ford? That's Nissan. What, what EVs? The Lightning. Lightning? They have, they have a, well, I think they're doing EV Mustangs and some others. So they're doing like EV versions of their existing cars, aren't they? I don't know. So, wow, big truck with a, who, who buys F-150s that also want an EV? It sounds like a contradiction in crowds, but maybe they are out there. Um, so Ford's in a pretty tough place because you got Tesla and then you have some Chinese companies that are doing some pretty good things with EVs. Who knows? Are they high risk? Absolutely, extremely high debt firm, very risky, high beta industry. But are they cheap or rich? That's the part you have to figure out. So one thing we can definitely do very, very quickly is look at Ford's PE. I don't know what it is now. It's NA because they have negative earnings, so you can't even look at it now. But you could compare it to GM, who has a PE ratio of five. So really, really, really low PE. Why? Because it's an industry under a lot of stress, high beta. So, or we can do Macy's. Macy's PE is 4.3. You could compare that to Nordstrom. I can never remember Nordstrom's. Nordstrom's is 11. So why is Nordstrom's twice as expensive as Macy's? Is it their online sale, sales? Is it Nordstrom's stack? What are the things called? Is it the fact that Macy's is almost exclusively in malls? You know, what is it? Why, why does the market think Nordstrom is doing okay and Macy's on the way out of business? That's what you'd have to kind of guess. I could do Bed Bath and Beyond, but it's probably going to give me an NA because it is not making money. But we can look at a statistic called EV the cells, which is sorry. So I'm adding Yahoo Finance to my lawsuit list. So. They're, you're paying $3 for $1 of sales for Bed Bath & Beyond for Nordstrom's. You're paying only $1.76. So that's pretty interesting. So Bed Bath, as bad as they are, they still look expensive on a revenue basis. And in Macy's, their EV, the revenue is pretty close to um, the Nordstrom's, 144 and one. So when you have similar companies and you look at them, that gets a little more exciting. You say, well, why is this firm, these two firms, and maybe we could do Home Depot. Home Depot's got a PE ratio of 17. Mm -hmm. Lowe's has a PE ratio of 20. So why is Lowe's more expensive than Home Depot? That's the only question. You could just say, who cares? I'll buy Home Depot, it's 25% cheaper. Is that is that good analysis? Well, the question is, what if you just did that? You find companies in the same industry and you go long to firms that are cheap and go short to firms that are expensive. Over time, would you beat the market? And there's people have done studies of that to see if that's the case. Is it possible Home Depot has more debt than Lowe's? That could be part of it. So you could adjust for that. So that's what we're looking for here is to try to figure out why is this PE ratio so different than the others? And it can be a combination of all of these things. All right, so your numerators, you have the two choices, current stock price or, or market cap, that's only stockholders, our current enterprise value, which is both stockholders and the bondholders. Your denominators are earnings base, book value base, and revenue base. The earnings base are earnings per share. So you have price to earnings per share. 
EBIT and EBITDA, you use enterprise value for those. You have book value, you do price to book value, and you have revenue. You do enterprise value to revenue. Has anyone figured out when I picked enterprise value and when I picked price? No, Dante knows, but he had, he had this before. What was unique? So I did price to earnings, enterprise value to EBIT, EBITDA. I did price the book value, enterprise value the revenue. Any guesses on that? What's unique about EBIT, EBITDA, and revenue? And what's common about earnings per share and book value? Any guesses? After well, what's the key? What's the key two letters in in this? Bi before interest, right? So yeah, you're getting to it. So anything that is before interest expense, that's going to be shared between stockholders and bondholders because you haven't paid your interest yet. All right. What about revenue? Is revenue before or after interest expense? Well below it, well before, right? Well before interest expense. So EBIT, EBITDA, and revenue are all in loan income statement before interest expense. So you have to use enterprise value. Earnings per share and book value, those are both net of interest expense and net of debt. So you use price. All right. That's the key. If you don't do that, if you do, if you do price to revenue, you're going to find some company that says, wow, this is a really cheap company, like a Ford. And then you realize, wow, they got billions of dollars of debt. You need to add that back because they may not be all that cheap. You got all this debt instead of equity. They look really expensive when you add all that in because you haven't, if they have a lot of debt, earnings per share will be lower because you have to pay all that interest expense. But they have a lot of debt and you use something that's before interest expense. You know, you're using price, which doesn't include the debt, but you're doing debit that has the interest back. The stock's going to look really cheap. It's not cheap. It's just laden with debt. So you got to be very, very careful. All right. So that's the question on the exam is I might give you price to EBIT. And you got to tell me, yeah, price to EBIT is not a good ratio. Price belongs to stockholders. EBIT's before interest expense. It should be using enterprise value. You don't want to use enterprise value to book value. That makes no sense because book value is net of debt, net of interest expense. Now, there is one ratio that is wrong, which is price to revenue that you will see in Yahoo Finance. It's just a mistake. I, don't, I can't get them to fix it, but they do have price to sales on their website, and that's just completely wrong. It was fun. I had a guy named Jason speak to my security analysis class, and he was flipping between industries. And boy, he did it without even thinking. Yeah, the EV to sales, blah, 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 price earnings, blah, blah, blah. EV to die. He didn't, he didn't have to stop and they go, yeah, it's just so automatic to him. So yeah, scratch, scratch this ratio. It makes it, it's completely meaningless ratio. We could compare it to Ford to GM. So Ford, their price to sales is 0 0.31. Boy, that sounds really cheap, doesn't it? The enterprise value of the sales is 3.1. Why is it so much higher? It's like so much net. It's a 10 to one difference because they're highly, highly different. GM, same type of issue. Price to sales really, really low. EV to revenue at three, much more. That's the number you want to use when you're comparing. Otherwise, you're going to you can get really distorted analysis. All right, so this is part of the exam question that you know how to line these things up. So very, very, very important. Any concerns, questions on that? Y'all know what EBIT and EBITDA are? Just took that for granted. You had that in a previous class. EBIT is what? Earnings before interest and taxes. I hear students say earnings before income tax, and that's absolutely wrong. So it's earnings for interest and taxes, and what's the DA do? 
appreciation and harmonization. What's the most popular one? EBITDA. Why? Because of Dr. Demodaran. He says it's because we like saying EBITDA because it sounds fancy and all that. Is it a better number? I actually prefer CFO, cash from operations over EBITDA. I think it's a better number. Um, but all right. Book value, book value is just assets minus liabilities, real straightforward. And then revenue is just revenue. So it's real critical that you match the capital providers up with the right ratio, that you don't mix them. So the most common ratio is price to earnings, EV to EBIT, EV to EBITDA. The PEG ratio we already talked about, that's a pretty popular one. That's just your PE ratio over the expected growth. Pretty popular. Book value ratios, price to book value are, if you have a firm right now, we have, especially restaurants, we have a lot of restaurants that don't have net worth. They, they bought so much of their stock back that their net worth is negative. What you can do as a substitute is take 10 years of earnings and do your price to that. There's a really, really famous model out there called the Robert Schiller model. Or that's what he does. He takes the current value of the stock market and divides it by 10 years worth. And he actually adjusts it for inflation. So you can do that. I like doing, I like the price in multiple years. I think Bloomberg has actually even added some factors where they do that for you. You can look at price to 10 years of earnings for sure. I think it's actually becoming one of my more favorite ones because Exxon's price to earnings looked really low at the end of last year. And why is that? Well, because they made record profits last year because oil prices were up. People know oil prices are going to come down, so they look really cheap because the earnings are really high. But if you look at Exxon's price over 10 years of earnings where you have the whole cycle, then you have a better idea of how expensive they are. So price to multi-year works really well um, if you have firms that are very volatile. And a firm like Boeing, you should definitely use price to book value, but their book value is negative, so 10 years is about all you have. And then EV the sales, just one down there. And then you have the industry specific ones. So when do you use earnings, earnings based, when do you use book value based, and you use revenue based. So this is the second part of the question. I give you a company and you got to tell me which of those ratios are best. Now, earnings based, we use for everybody. Price to earnings, you can use for everybody. You can use it for a bank, for uh, a retail. Um, you can, we use price to earnings, but uh, it's not the it's not the main ratio we use for these industries, but you can use PE. But earnings base, those are those for industries that are really, really focused on growth. So the growthy type of companies like, like technology, obviously. We almost always use EV to EBITDA for tech stocks. It's just so common to use EV to EBITDA. And peg ratios are really, really popular for tech companies. So earnings base, just the obvious thing to do. You're not going to use a price to book for uh, an NVIDIA. It just it doesn't make any sense. You might use price to book for Intel, and we'll talk about that. But you're not going to use a price to book for Zoom or NVIDIA. Um, revenue, EV the revenue is common with tech companies, but it it's still EV to EBITDA is probably the most popular. Book value base, there's two type of industries there, or three type of industries there. Firms with high, high capital requirements. And how do you know that? You just look at their balance sheet and see how much property plant equipment is as a percentage of assets. When it's a huge number, price to book makes a lot of sense. So utilities, manufacturing. I mentioned Intel. Intel is a tech company, but they're all also fabricators. They're building these billion dollar fabrication plants. They have a lot of property plant equipment. You could use price to book for, it, for an Intel. So just look, that's how you can tell like with NVIDIA, NVIDIA's property plant equipment is a small, small percentage of their assets. For Intel, it's a huge percentage of their assets. So price to book could work. As I mentioned before, cyclical type of companies like energy and materials, you don't want to use earnings base because the earnings is so volatile. So price to book or price to 10 years of earnings work really, really well for energy and materials. I had one guy come in who, who his, his industry or his asset class was emerging markets. And he argued price to book for emerging markets because of the really wild cycles of those. And a lot of them are energy and material based uh, anyway. And then banks, insurance companies, those are focused return on invested capital. 
banks and insurance companies, we always use price to book. It's just a norm. Now it's gotten strange because I grew up, I grew up that banks are supposed to have, oh my word. I don't know how to, I don't know how much I have to pay them to have them stop that. So I grew up in a world where price to books for banks are supposed to be two to one. That was my first 20, 15 years of my career. If a bank's book value is a billion dollars, the bank should be trading for $2 billion. That was, so what is Bank of America trading for? They're less than a dollar. Now that shouldn't be true, right? Isn't accounting, gap accounting supposed to be conservative? Shouldn't every entity trade for more than this book value? I mean, we can look at NVIDIA. Their price to book is 22. So you're paying $22 for $1 or gap earnings. Is gap that conservative? That's pretty conservative, right? So you'd expect it to be higher, but, but banks, and let me show you Citibank. Citibank is a ridiculously cheap bank. Their price of book is 50 cents. You can buy Citibank stock for half of what the account, most conservative accountants are using all these conservative principles. You can buy Citibank for one half of what that value is. Um, here's another one, Genworth, an insurance company. Their price to book is 28 cents. You can buy Genworth at a 62% discount to what the conservative accountants. So we're in a we're, we're in a very, very strange world right now. Now, JP Morgan is probably like a one and a half or something. Haven't looked at them in a while. So yeah, JP Morgan's up there a lot higher. Does it make sense that JP Morgan's three times more expensive than Citibank? Maybe. They got, they got diamond and you know, bigger footprint and all of that. Um, so we, we look at companies, we can look at a life insurance company like MetLife. They're trading pretty expensive, 225. Why is that? Because life insurance companies are just extremely leveraged firms. Um, but anyway, price the book for insurance companies, banks, that's what you use. If USAA were to ever sell their bank, they're probably gonna go out with the Capital One, Frostbank, and a few like that, and see they're all around one. And USA says it's pretty, pretty obvious our bank's net worth is 1.5 billion. They're probably gonna sell it for about 1.5 billion. It's gonna be, pretty, now 10 years ago, they could sell it, or 15 years ago, they could have sold it for 3 billion but today. And it really was 2008. You know, We were at two to one, two to one, two to one, and in 2008 hit, and banks went down like 10 and 15 cents. They just nosedived, they're really, really cheap. And they just have not come back to those three, three levels at all. Um, but price of book, if you're interviewing with a bank or an insurance company, don't talk to them about their PE ratios, talk to them about their price to book. Cause I, hey, I noticed your price to book fell back to low one. Why, why do you think that is? I don't, I don't know if you interview, you're interviewing with Frost Bank. I don't, there, I don't remember the second letter or third letter in theirs. So pretty expensive bank, 323. Why is Frost so expensive? Why are they twice as expensive? Would you pay twice as much for Frost as you would for JP Morgan? What's the, anybody know the real key for Frost? There's one thing they have that makes them wonderful. They have a really low loan to deposit ratio. Why would we love a really low loan to deposit ratio? Just means they have a capacity for really growing fast. They got a lot of lending capacity. They're very low risk. Deposits are wonderful banks. We love deposits. Why? Because you're paying almost, you know, what are they paying on your savings accounts? 0.2%. How many of y'all have loaned Frost money at 0.2% without the FDIC insurance? really cheap way to borrow money. So yeah, Frost is an expensive bank. Capital One, which is probably more like what USA would be. They're trading below book value. USA would probably sell the bank closer to one because they, well, I don't know, they've had some pretty bad stuff happen to them recently. Mm -hmm. 
But both banks are heavy, heavy credit card banks. So USA would probably come in the same neighborhood. Um, so yeah, price of book, very, very common for well, this almost exclusively used for banks and insurance companies. Now, real estate companies, if you're doing a real estate investment trust, yeah, you'd probably use price to book for real estate. It would make the most sense. Um, and then the last one, revenue base, any retail firm is going to use, you know, loan, Lowe's, Home Depot, Walmart, Costco, EV, the revenue is, is the thing you go to. It's just we run models in the investment society and we bring in PE ratios, price to book, EV to sales, and we let the model tell us on retail 100% of the time, it puts 100% of the model in EV to sales because that's just what you look at there. So any industry where margins are the key, especially gross margins, you're going to use EV to sales. But it's really important you think about the gross margins. I love Costco. I would love to own Costco stock, but I don't like Costco stuff right now because Costco stocks EV the sales is pretty high and it should be really low because their margins are so thin. So their margins, you know, a dollar revenue at Costco is not worth the same as a dollar revenue at a Tiffany's because the margins are so thin. And yet Costco's trading really, really rich right now. So I, I love the company. I think it's really incredibly well managed, but it just looks expensive to me right now. All right, so let's test this. Um, someone comes to you with, uh, oh man, can I think of some companies here? Um, Adobe, someone says, hey, I wanna look at Adobe. You say, well, let me go look, see how they're trading. What, what ratio might you use for Adobe? I thought I heard price to book. I don't know if I've used price to book. I would use price. Is that, did I hear that right, y'all? Yeah. Yes. <laughs> price to earnings or EV EBITDA. I would put Adobe in that high growth tech like company. They may have some book value if you're thinking a lot of property plant equipment, but you can you can look at it and just see it. It usually stands out pretty pretty fast. So their property plant equipment is less than 10% of their assets. So that's not a big part of their business. They're not building a lot of plants, factories, and those kind of things. So EV David would make the most sense for a firm like that. Um, what about Target? What would be the obvious thing to use with Target? EV the sales. Yeah, you would definitely use EV the sales. Their EV the sales is three. Should be much higher than Costco's. Let's see how much higher it is. Ah. Is anyone getting sick and tired of this? <laughs> so shouldn't Target have a higher EV the sales than Target? I mean, in Costco, absolutely, because Costco's margins are so thin. Y'all see why I don't like Costco. It should not be paying a higher EV to sales for Costco than I do for Target because Target has wider margins. So Costco looks mispriced. Um, what about Duke? What would you use for Duke? Price the book, utility. So if you look at their financials, They're, look at that. Their property plant equipment is like 70%, 80% of their assets. So you can see how quickly you can tell a price of book makes sense. That's why I was talking, you look at NVIDIA. NVIDIA's property plant equipment is less than 10% of their assets. And then you look at Intel, their property plant equipment is, is over a third a lot more property plant equipment. So price the book could work for an Intel, although EV EBITDA would work as well. Uh, what about Exxon? I remember, sells a commodity, very volatile, cyclical business. 
price to book value. Their price to book is 242, a lot higher than banks. Why is that? No, I can't explain banks. That makes sense to me. So um, let's see, what am I leaving out here? Uh, Chubb. What did you use for Chubb? It, it sells uh, commercial insurance. An insurance company. You haven't heard of them because I don't think they advertise because it's a business to business. <clears throat> Surely someone knows. Price the book, insurance company. Is this, y'all throw out a company. Is there a company you're not sure of? What about McDonald's? EV to sales, yeah, EV, I would use EV to sales for McDonald's. Um, uh, even as a franchiser, the margins are pretty key. Now you could argue that McDonald's is more real estate than, than uh, but most people will use an EV for McDonald's just because they're a restaurant. But price to book, you may be able to argue price to book just because they, they do own a lot of real estate. Same thing with an HEV. Um, what about um, Packard? They build diesel engines. Price to book, yeah, manufacturer. Right, so y'all, you kind of get the sense of what what it is. No, like airlines, these ones, yeah, airlines are tricky, so um, they are heavy capital. And so your price to book can work. What usually I see in airlines. And we do this investment society, it might go like 40% for price to book and 60% EV to sales. So I've seen it, the model will like use some of both. But but let the Walmart or Target, you see go 100% EV to sales. It doesn't even look at price to book or, or EV to the dollar. Uh, so yeah, heavy, heavy capital retailers. Yeah, there are some of those out there. That's why airlines are just a home business. A lot of capital requirements, thin margins. Um, yeah, I think I've covered most in here. Uh, even a Google or Google or a, a Meta, even though they're not in tech anymore, they current communication services, you would still do an EV to dog. Now, AT and T traditionally, AT and T was priced above, no question. AT and T's switching now. Who knows what they really are today? It's not always obvious on the exam. It should be pretty obvious, but if not, you know, give me your best argument. So this is really, really important. There are other ratios besides these. So utility would probably use um, enterprise value to regulatory assets. So utilities have something called regulatory assets. Those are the assets that they're allowed to price off, off of. So that, instead of using price to book, they use EV. Why EV? Well, because regulatory assets are before debt. There's no debt subtracted out. Um, trying to think of some other special ones. I mentioned investment firms, so EV to assets under management is a really, really common one for them. Uh, and there probably are some others. Uh, um, I didn't mention cash from operations. You have ratios, usually when you use cash from operations, it's, it's on the earnings base. So I mentioned real estate. What? Most real estate companies use is price the funds from operations. Fund from operations isn't quite CFO. It's similar, but it's not quite, but that's a very specific. So real estate companies do, do price to funds from operations. I mean, from yeah, funds from operations. Yeah, if you don't have any money, then you know you might say you got this tech company, I should use EV David Dobb, but David is negative. A lot of times you're stuck with EV, the revenue, because it's the only positive number you got. So yeah, if, if all you have is EV, the revenue, then, then, then use that. So if there's no earnings, there's no book value, you're, you're stuck with one. All right, so what can you use enterprise value for? Screening stocks, like I just talked about this, you could do the same thing with bonds. You could look at their spreads and do a saved up analysis. Definitely use for value non-publicly traded firms. I'm sure USA did some of that when they sold off to Victory Capital. 
I'm sure I'm sure Valero did that when they sold Cornerstone store. It's almost the first thing they do. I'm, I know the investment bankers are going to come in and say, let's do evaluation. But what Damodaran discovered was they say they're doing a present value discounted cash flow, but then what he discovers is they're forecasting the firm for five years. Then they're plugging a PE ratio at five, the fifth year, and they're discounting that. And he says, that's not discounted cash flow. That's still relative value. Because 90 something percent of your valuation is just a PE ratio. So that doesn't work. Uh, determining benchmarks. I use this at USAA to try to figure out what should our ratios be? So I ran the entire industry and looked at our numbers. Our numbers, we didn't have public numbers, but I could look at the industry and say, hey, based on other companies in our industry, this is what our return on equity should be. This is what our margins should be. Um, and then what is the stock market focused in on? A few years ago, the, the stock market was actually paying more for firms with high debt and less for firms with low debt. And it's like, why? Well, that makes no sense. There's something squirrely going on here. Uh, that's probably not the case today. All right. I don't know if I'm going to show you some examples or not. You can join the Investment Society in the, in the fall. We do. We build the models in the fall. So you can build one from scratch or watch my YouTube, YouTube uh, channel and I'll show you how to do that. So, all right. Let's, let's stop it there.